Okay, well, what is asthma? Now, those of you that have it probably know, and those of you that don't, I mean, when you hear that word, asthma, and it's, you know, it's an old word, it's a common word in, in, in our language, what does it mean to you? Right. Okay, it has something to do with airways, or what we call the bronchi, you know, in, in, in the lung. What else? What, you know, what does asthma mean as opposed to other things that have to do with the lung? Okay, difficulty breathing. Wheezing. Okay. Anything else? What? Okay. All right. Yeah, well, that's all true. Asthma actually, the word actually goes from the, or comes from the Greek language. And in Greek, it comes from a word meaning hard breathing. Okay, so that's what it is. You know, it's, it's, it's hard breathing. However, you know, there are many things that can cause hard breathing or shortness of breath, or as we technically say, dyspnea, you know. I've seen that word, dyspnea. Okay, so asthma is one of, of uh, many different lung diseases, and it's one of the major lung diseases. So today, we're going to talk about what asthma is and what it isn't. We're going to talk about who gets asthma and why. We're going to talk about how do we make the diagnosis? How do we know that the patient has asthma and some other condition? And then, of course, we're going to spend a lot of time on what do we do about asthma? What is the treatment? Okay. Okay, so what is asthma? Well, for many, many, many years, the whole idea or the central idea about asthma was something called bronchospasm. Is that, is that oh, that's the wrong one. Okay. Bronchospasm. Now, we, we all kind of know what spasm means. You know, spasm, like in your leg or something like a cramp, has to do with the muscle kind of going into in, in, in the spasm or, or, or contraction. And these air tubes in our lung, called the bronchi, if you see a picture of them, they kind of look like, you know, branches of a tree without any leaves on them, okay? But actually, they have tiny little muscle cells around them, okay, called the bronchial smooth muscle. And those can go into spasm. And when they do, it closes down. And when that happens, what I tell people, it's like as though you had to breathe through a straw. You can imagine, you know, someone gave you a straw, and you're trying to breathe through the straw. It would be pretty, pretty, pretty difficult. So that's, you know, for many, 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 many years, that's what we considered asthma to be, and that's what asthma is. However, in the last 40 or 50 years, we've, we've come to a, a more, I should say, complex or complete idea of, of what asthma is. And it's important because it helps us to understand the difference between acute asthma and chronic asthma, okay? So in addition to bronchospasm, there are, what, there are a lot of what we call secretions, a lot of mucus in the lung. And the secretions plug up those little bronchi so that the oxygen can't get in there, okay? And also, we know that in those airways, there's a lot of inflammation. And what does that mean? Well, when, when these air tubes are inflamed, they become thicker. And when they become thicker, they, the space going through is narrower. So all these three things cause blockage or narrowing of those airways, and that's why the asthmatic has such a, a, a trouble uh, breathing. Okay. Well, who, who gets asthma? Okay. Uh, kids get asthma. You know, there are uh, kids that, 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 that get asthma. Um, I have a 22-month-old grandson 
who's been coughing a lot, and he's been to see various doctors, and they think, oh, well, this, you know, may be allergic asthma, because he's got, you know, the little circles under his eye that, that indicate uh, asthma. So asthma is certainly a, a disease common in children. In fact, asthma is the most common chronic disease in children. It's, it's, it's the most common cause of, of, of missing school, asthma. So in the pediatric population, <clears throat> it's a very important disease. Some people don't have asthma as kids, and then when they get to their 30s or 40s, they begin to develop it. And then some people have it all the way through, through their, their, their life. And we used to talk about two different kinds of, of asthma. Uh, we don't talk about it so much anymore because it's kind of simplistic that uh, kids got what is called extrinsic asthma. And it was usually due to some specific allergy that they had. Whereas the asthma in adults was called intrinsic asthma because very often you couldn't pinpoint a specific allergy that was causing the asthma. But you know, the, every, it's probably combined in, 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 in most people anyway. Okay, so kids get asthma, adults get asthma, and if, if we focus in on severe asthma, it's important to understand which asthmatics end up getting into the hospital. And again, as it turns out, that's far more common among children. Okay? Pediatric asthma accounts for a lot more admissions to the hospital than adult, than adult asthma. Okay? Also, um, there actually ethnic differences in terms of severe asthma. Uh, if, if you look at different ethnic groups, um, <laughs> strangely, one of the highest instances of severe asthma is among Puerto Ricans. Don't ask me why, but it's also relatively high among African Americans. Okay? And that may have something to do with genetics. We're beginning to kind of understand how genetics influences whether you get asthma or not, and whether you respond to therapy or not. That's just in its infancy. We don't, we don't know a whole lot about that, that yet. Suffice it to say that different ethnic groups uh, have different uh, frequencies of asthma and different severity of asthma. And then if you look at men and women, men and women, is there a difference? Well, as, as happens in, in many different diseases, one difference is Women who have asthma are much more likely to come to the doctor, complain about their symptoms, worry about their medicines than men who have asthma. And of course, I mean, I see that in a lot of men and women in, in different diseases. You know, women have different approaches to disease uh, than, than, than men do, okay? So there are all those differences in who gets asthma and, 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 and how bad it is, okay? Now, um, let's see, what, that's kind of what asthma is. What isn't asthma? Because again, there are a lot of different things that can cause shortness of breath, okay? For example, um, I probably see 500 patients a year who develop a cough that lasts for weeks and weeks and maybe months, and it's well known that Sometimes that's a manifestation of asthma. Certainly am, among children, among kids, uh, like my own grandson, uh, children asthmatics tend to cough a lot. And it also occurs in adults who present with cough, but strictly speaking, they usually have wheezing as well. Wheezing is a more characteristic sign of asthma than cough. And there's some other things that are much more commonly a cause of chronic cough. For example, a postnasal drip or acid reflux. Okay, they're very common causes of cough that, that, that goes, goes on and on and on and on. So cough may or may not be a sign of, of, of asthma. Uh, sometimes asthma is related to the workplace, what we call occupational asthma. In fact, occupational asthma has been known to doctors for over 400 years. You go back to the 16th century. There was a book written uh, that uh, talked about Baker's asthma. Somehow Baker's 
uh, we're more likely to get, get short of breath. And there are hundreds of different workplace situations that can give rise to asthma. You know, so the patients find on weekends when they're not at work or when they go on vacation, but they go to work and they come home you know, being short of breath. So sometimes occupation uh, is, is, is a cause of, of, of asthma. Okay, so that's kind of what asthma is and, and what it may be or, or, or not. Now, how do we make the diagnosis? Well, like in any disease, first of all, we start with the history, okay? Uh, if, uh, if the patient is short of breath but only in certain situations or uh, exposure to certain allergens, okay? You, I used to have a neighbor, uh, he, w he was fine until he mowed his lawn. And then he developed, you know, sh you know shortness, of, shortness of breath. So you start, you know, with the history and, uh, you know, hopefully it's complete enough. So you say, well, may, is this patient at risk for heart disease? Could that be going on? Uh, y y you know, uh, is the patient always short of breath? Are they only short of breath when they exercise? Oh, and by the way, the, 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 there's, there's another specific form of asthma that uh, can occur in teenagers as they begin to get into sports. It's called exercise-induced asthma. That, that's, another, that's another type of, 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 of asthma, okay? So you start with the history, and, and sometimes uh, someone's already given the patient an asthma medicine. And if they feel better taking the medicine, then you begin to think, well, yeah, maybe this, maybe this is, is asthma. But you always have to worry about other things. And particularly, the older the patient, the more likely you have to worry about, well, maybe this is heart disease, or, or maybe this is something else going on, okay? So you start with the history, and then the examination, okay? And classically, we say we hear wheezes. Well, what are wheezes? Well, uh, wheezes are kind of like um, a whistle sometimes, okay? When I listen to someone's chest with my stethoscope, normal breathing kind of sounds like this. But a wheeze would sound like this. Okay? And classically in asthma, the wheezes are mainly when you blow out. Because as we'll see in a few minutes, asthma is what's called an obstructive lung disease. The patient has trouble pushing the air out. So the wheeze occurs usually when they push the air out. Now, when they get extremely severe, then they begin to have wheezes both when they breathe out and when they breathe in, okay? So if you hear wheezes, then that tends to push you toward, yeah, well, this must be asthma. However, if the patient has asthma that comes and goes, when they come to see me or the doctor in the clinic, we might not hear any wheezes, okay? So it may not be clear that this is a problem, that this is an asthmatic, or that <clears throat> asthma is causing the shortness of breath, okay? So you have your history and then your examination. But the definitive, well, and then I'm always going to get a chest x ray, okay, because there are other things lung cancer, uh, heart failure, uh, pneumonia uh, that could account for shortness of breath, okay? So we're always going to check a uh, a chest x-ray. By and large, however, asthmatics chest x-rays look normal, okay? They look normal, all right? So you have your history, your examination, and your chest x-ray. But the definitive way of determining whether the patient has asthma or not is with pulmonary function tests, or so-called PFTs. So how many have had PFTs? Okay, so you guys know all about it. So what happens with PFTs? Well, the simplest thing is you, you breathe into a machine and it, it records how, how fast you're breathing, how much you're breathing, or they put you in this little chamber uh, that we call the plethysmograph. It looks kind of like a phone booth, although in a couple of years, people are not gonna know what phone booths look like. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, um, uh, and then we do, do more, more elaborate testing. So we look to see how fast the patient can breathe out, okay? And we measure their vital capacity, okay? 
How do we measure that? Well, we said take a real deep breath and then blow it out as fast as you can, okay? And we measure how much comes out. That's the vital capacity. And actually, we've been measuring vital capacities in people for over 150 years. It's a very old test, okay? We also look at how much you get out in the first second. That's very important, okay? And if those two go down, then number one, we know something's wrong with the lungs, okay? However, other things besides asthma can do the same thing, okay? But that kind of suggests this is probably asthma. So what do we do when the patient's in the lab getting the test? If they show an abnormality, if they can't breathe out fast enough, then the therapist will give them an inhaler to breathe and redo the test. And if it's classic asthma, they should get better, okay? Uh, if they don't, it's maybe something else, which brings up another important term, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, okay? Now, occasionally, or not occasionally, very often, uh, patients coming to see me will say, oh, doctor, do, do I have COPD? Um, when, you know, people have said, well, for years, well, you've got asthma. And it's, I have to very carefully explain the difference or, or the similarities. How many here have been told they have COPD? Anybody? Okay. Well, it's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Okay. And uh, an asthmatic who has severe asthma and needs medicine every day has a chronic disease, it's an obstructive disease, and it's pulmonary disease. So are they COPD? Well, usually in, in, in any area of medicine, you can be a lumper or a splitter, okay? If you're a, a splitter, you can say, well, no, COPD is, is different. It's usually only in smokers, and very few asthmatics smoke. Some do, but very few are able to, 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 to pick up the habit. So if you're a splitter, you're gonna say, no, COPD is just the lung disease that's associated with smoking. Usually the patients have emphysema along with it, and they don't respond as well to, to bronchodilators, as opposed to asthma, where you should see a good response to bronchodilators, which we're gonna talk about in detail along. If you're, um, and if you're a splitter also, there are certain remedies, surgical remedies for COPD that we don't use in asthma, okay? Like what's called lung reduction uh, surgery or lung transplantation. Now, if you're a lumper, you can say, well, listen, uh, asthma and COPD act the same way. We use the same medicines, right? And they're all, all prone to bronchitis and they, they get infected. So there are a lot of similarities between asthma and COPD, but then there are important, important differences. But I would, I would say um, that uh, if you've never been a smoker and if you're doing well on bronchodilators, it's better to say, well, this is asthma, as opposed to saying, well, this is COPD, okay? Um, but if you're someone who's on heavy medicines all the time and get admitted to the hospital a lot, well, then maybe we could say, well, no, that's really, really uh, COPD. Okay, and actually, um, I brought the poor person's pulmonary function test. Okay, mm -hmm. this is a peak flow meter, okay? And the way uh, you set it to zero and you take it over. <sighs> and you see how far the patient can go. And in fact, when we do pulmonary function tests in the lab, we also measure this, okay? But this is portable, and we like to give it to asthmatics so that when they be, have symptoms, they, we can actually get some objective measure of what's going on with their lungs and not just their feeling of, 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 sh of shortness of, of breath. Uh, that's a peak flow meter, and later on, if anyone wants to test themselves, uh, they, 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 they can do that. Okay, so um, that's how we, we make the diagnosis. Well, any questions at this point? Yeah. yeah. The topic of the, um, this discussion is going to be um, a 
allergic and induced asthma and non-allergic induced asthma. So what's the difference? In, what should we really know? Well, again, um, the general feeling over the years has been asthma in children is virtually always due to some allergy. And as they get older, they may get over the allergy so that the asthma goes away. Someone in their 30s or 40s who comes in shorter breath and the pulmonary function tests indicate asthma, um, well, we just go ahead and treat it, okay? But if they don't respond very well to treatment, then it's usually indicated to refer them for allergy testing, okay, to see, well, what are they allergic to? And if so, can they avoid what they're allergic to? Of course, the problem is, more often than not, you'll find, well, they're allergic to dust. Well, how can anyone avoid dust, you know? And uh, sometimes I have to tell people, well, if, if you want to move to the moon, <laughs> you know, uh, you're never going to be able to get away from the things that you're uh, allergic to. And uh, another way to approach your question is, a lot of asthmatics, particularly children who have asthma, are followed by allergists, okay? So we pulmonologists follow them, allergists follow them. Sometimes the ear, nose, and throat doctors are seeing, you know, patients with, with, with asthma, okay? So uh, I, again, uh, I think the best way to answer your, your question is uh, whether it's allergic or not, the treatment is more or less the same in terms of medicine. The only difference being if, if the patient is clearly allergic to something, they have to try to avoid it. You know, like my neighbor, he have to get someone else, get his wife to mow the lawn or so, something like that, you know, okay. So turning to treatment, okay. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Is, is asthma always a result of an allergy? No, it is not always the result of an allergy. Sometimes, particularly with adults, they'll their pulmonary function tests will clearly indicate asthma. And they go to the allergist and they get tested and the allergist says, no, you're not allergic to anything. So we don't have a clear idea of what is, is causing their asthma. But as I said a, a few minutes ago, we're beginning to understand something about the genetics of asthma, why some people may be more susceptible to developing asthma just because of their genetics and, 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 and their sen sensitivities uh, to different things. And by the way, uh, j just to get, say something else about pulmonary function tests, sometimes we suspect asthma and that we do the pulmonary function tests and they're completely normal. Well, does that mean the patient doesn't have asthma? No, it doesn't. There's another test we can do, and some of you may have had, it's called a bronchochallenge test, where they give the patient something to inhale that would bring out asthma, okay? Uh, and if the patient becomes abnormal with that test, then clearly it's saying there's something going on with their air tubes in their lung that makes them very susceptible. Maybe it's just cool air. Maybe it's dust. Uh, <clears throat> I hate to say stress or anxiety because those things generally don't cause disease, but they can make disease worse. It can make disease worse. Okay, well, in terms of therapy, for, <clears throat> oh, I don't know, 20 years maybe, we've had national guidelines for the treatment of asthma that come out of the National Institutes of Health. And we stratify asthmatics <clears throat> into four stages. Mild, intermittent, mild, persistent, uh, moderate persistent and severe persistent. Now my neighbor <clears throat> with the mowing of the lawn, he would be mild intermittent because most of the time he's okay. Mild persistent <coughs> sorry, means that the patient's using their medicine almost every day. Moderate persistent means they're beginning to have symptoms at night, okay? Maybe they're missing work or school because of their asthma. And severe persistent means uh, maybe they can't get to work or school. They're going to the emergency room every, every couple of months, maybe get hospitalized. So we have those stratifications of, of, of asthma. Now, how do we treat asthma? Well, 
The paradigm in treating asthma, we have a lot of different medicines. And we have what we call the rescue medicines, and we have what we call the controller medicines. The rescue medicines are the medicines that the patient uses when they need it. And it acts fast, but it doesn't have long acting. The primary one, the primary rescue medicine that we use in this country is albuterol. And it's marketed as Proair, Ventolin, uh, albuterol. The other, hmm? A-L, A-L-B-U-T-E-R-O-L. -L now, another short-acting rescue medicine that um, gets used a lot in asthma, not as much, is what's called ipratropium. Ipratropium, or Advent, or uh, uh, Atrovent, Atrovent, Ipratropium. That, by the way, is used a lot in COPD and, and also in, in asthma. So those are basically the rescue medicines that the patient you know, carries with them, uses uh, when they need them. Now, an important point to discuss about the rescue medicines is how they're delivered, okay? The portable one is what we call the MDI, the meter dose inhaler, where what you have to do is you have to squeeze it and it comes out as a, a spray or an aerosol and you have to time it to breathing. Alternative to that is a nebulizer, you know, the machine where you put the, the, the medicine into the little cup and you breathe it in and out 10, 15, 10, 15 minutes. Well, what's the difference? Well, when it's been critically studied scientifically, it's shown that neither one is more effective than the other. But in practice, that's not exactly the case because a lot of people have difficulty using the MDI and they don't use it right. And maybe most of it sticks in their mouth and doesn't get into their lungs. Whereas for a lot of people, it's easier to use the nebulizer. Now, of course, the disadvantage is you need to plug it in so you can't carry it with you. So, you know, there's a combination of nebulizer at home and the MDI, um, you know, out um, when you're out and about. Uh, now, you know, there's been this concern about the ozone layer and the effect of these aerosols on the ozone layer. So, a lot of the companies, as you may know, are trying to go to sort of powder-based uh, in, in inhalers, which may or may not be easier or harder to use, okay? I don't know whether anyone here uses the Respimat. Anyone hear that? Yeah. Well, that's uh, another aerosol, but unfortunately, it's kind of complicated to use, but um, okay. So these are the main rescue medicines. And if the patient is using a rescue medicine almost every day, then they should also be on a controller medicine, okay? What are the controller medicines? Well, one of the most important one is what we call LABA, long-acting beta agonist, okay? The most, and there are a couple of those. There's uh, uh, salmeterol, formeterol, um, and uh, the, under Foradil or Cerevent, I don't know if any of you have, have, have used th those brand names. But these are seldom used alone. And the reason why they're seldom used alone is about 20 years ago, there was a big study called the SMART study where they looked at this and they found that people who used this did worse than people who didn't use it. But one of the criticisms made uh, in that study was they used l this LABA without a steroid. So nowadays, almost always, it's prescribed as two drugs, okay? And I'm sure some of you have heard, you know, we have Advair, yeah. we have Dulera, we have Simbacor, Okay. Well, I'll get back to that in a minute. But these are the three chief drugs where you have both the LABA and the steroid.
okay? QVAR is just a steroid. It doesn't have the long-acting beta agent in it, okay? That's what, what, what QVAR is. And the one you're on depends on the formulary of your insurance, right? <laughs> and uh, and Advair must be very expensive because I, I notice a lot of patients who have been on Advair, the, 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 the pharmacy benefit says, no, you gotta switch them to Dulera or Simbacor, okay? Which they don't like because Advair, you know, was kind of easier to use. <laughs> Than, than Dulera or, 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 or Simbacort. So you run into these practical problems of the delivery system and, 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 and how to um, get it. Now, actually there's one LABA uh, that, that can be used in the nebulizer and that's Brovana. Okay. So this is basically the most important of the controller medicines, okay? However, uh, and as someone brought up QVAR, as the patient gets worse, we tend to increase the amount of steroids they're on. And why is that? Well, that gets back to the, 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 the point that a very important aspect of uh, the pathology of asthma is the inflammation in the airways. And albuterol, ipotropium, uh, the long-acting beta agent, they don't do anything about the inflammation, okay? The steroids are directed toward the inflammation in the airways, okay? So if a patient's already on one of these medicines, we might go to the form that has a higher amount of steroids, or we might add something like QVAR, which is just the steroid alone. And of course, as the patient gets very bad, they go to prednisone, <coughs> which of course is an oral steroid, okay, with all the bad side effects of oral steroids. The advantage of things like QVAR and Advair and these is that the steroid only goes into the lung where you want it to be. It doesn't get to the rest of your body, okay, whereas prednisone goes to your entire body. Short term, okay. But long term, over years, there are many bad things that can happen. Early cataracts, uh, drains calcium out of your bones. So uh, the, the goal, my goal as a doctor treating asthmatics who require prednisone is to try to keep them on the lowest possible dose that I can, okay, that I can, all right? And that's sometimes a problem because patients just don't feel well unless they're on a lot of prednisone, and of course then they get puffy face and you know, they don't like that either. Um, so, you know, prednisone, uh, you can say, is the most powerful um, of our controller medicines. And when these, the patients get admitted to the hospital, very often they get steroids intravenously, what's called, you know, solumedrol, solumedrol. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's the kind of panoply of the uh, rescue medicines and the uh, controller medicines uh, in, in the treatment of, uh, of, treatment of asthma. Uh, now, um, is there anything really new in, in, in terms of asthma? Well, there have been a f couple developments, say, over the, last, over the last 10 years. Patients who have very severe allergic asthma have high levels of something in their blood called IgE, okay. uh, which is a protein which is associated with, with very bad allergy. And if someone like that just isn't doing well on all these other medicines, there's one of the newer drugs that's been around for about 10 years called Zolaire. Anyone here been on Zolaire? Okay. Okay. Zolaire is directed against the allergy and against this IgE, but it has to be given by injection, usually done in the allergist's office like every, every, every two weeks, every two weeks. Okay, so that's, that's Zolaire, okay, but that's reserved for a very select uh, number of, of, of asthmatics. Now going back to what I said about bronchospasm, you know, those little smooth muscle cells, you know, squeeze, you know, 
why did we evolve to have that? You know, uh, how did that uh, influence our survival? It's kind of hard to understand, although you can say if you were exposed to some toxic, well, like smoke in, in, in a fire, you wouldn't want to get a lot of it into your lungs. So maybe that's why we evolved to have these uh, muscle cells go into spasm to prevent that. Maybe, maybe. But uh, at any rate, so you would think, well, gee, uh, if you could do something, what if you could get rid of those muscle cells? Okay, then this wouldn't happen, right? Okay, well, uh, in the last couple of years, people have started to work with something called something called bronchothermy. <laughs> What is bronchothermia is? Well, <laughs> basically it's nuke the smooth muscle cells, <laughs> okay? So, um, uh, so uh, the, the patient's put under sedation. Uh, the uh, doctor uses a bronchoscope, you know, which goes into the lungs. And there's a probe with microwaves. So it pushes it down into the lung and activates the microwave, which gives local heat and does something at least to injure those muscle cells. Now this is still, I would still call it kind of a research uh, technique, but uh, it's possible, you know, it's, it's desperation city. In a patient who just cannot, just doesn't respond to maximum medications, is hypoxic, is in the hospital all the time, uh, might be a candidate for this. And, and actually, here at UCLA, uh, Dr. Uh, Bando, Dr. Joanne Bando is the one that does that, okay. But that, again, is a very rare, rarely indicated uh, you know, treatment for very, very severe asthma. Well, I think that's all I have to say about asthma. And, uh, I'm open to questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, are there any generics that one can purchase outside the country, like um, Advair in a generic form? I know something new is coming in Germany this fall. Yeah. Um, none of these, unfortunately, are generic. But I do know patients who are able to get them in Mexico or Canada. Okay. Yeah. There are you know, places you can write to uh, outside, outside the country. Okay. Yeah. But, but, but these are all still, you know, on patent. Yes, ma'am. Does it make any sense that someone could have an asthma attack while they're on a general anesthetic? Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's possible. It's, it's, it's pretty rare. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty rare. Um, it, I can see that it, uh, it might be more difficult, you, you know, w w when you're put under anesthesia, they put the tube down through your throat to ventilate you. They might have some difficulty getting the patient off a breathing machine. So that might be, might be prolonged. Uh, whether that's due to asthma, you know, one problem is when you're under anesthesia and you're not taking big breaths or what we call sighs, you know, some of the airways begin to collapse in the lung. And, and, and so when you come out of anesthesia, uh, you, you might not be breathing normally. Uh, that's the best I can answer that question. I haven't heard of it as uh, an, important, uh, an, an important problem in, in anesthesia. What's more important in patients undergoing anesthesia who have lung disease is whether they have a lot of bronchitis and a lot of mucus in their lungs. That's the, that's the major risk factor uh, for anesthesia. Yes? Yeah. Uh, you were talking about how, um, you know, kids usually have the al allergies. Uh, the story that you were giving, mine's the opposite. I developed an allergy, and I think from that allergy, I have asthma, and the main uh, al allergy that I have is corn. So I know, uh, do you suggest I do that, those, those alert shots to 
so that, that would reduce my... Um, well, but your, your doctor would have to test you for this. Because if this isn't elevated, then the Zolaire's not going to help. Okay. Um, so the best thing to do is just to avoid the out. The well, avoidance is always the best way, sure. If, 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 if you can avoid it. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. What explanation do they, or do they <coughs> hypothesize about how you could go until you're in your you know, later 30s, 40s, whatever, and then you develop an allergy? to corn or something. I mean, what's the immunological trigger that would switch that? I wish I could answer that. You know, why do people, why do people get, get to their 40s or 50s and all of a sudden find out they're gluten sensitive? And they never were, you know. I, I mean, you know, there's something in our genome, uh, I, you know, uh, that as we get older, I, I mean, our immune systems definitely change as, as we get older. Uh, you know, why some people begin to develop allergies then. I mean, clearly you, you could move into a situation where there was something you were always allergic to but were just never exposed to, you know, but... Uh, you know what I've heard, like, um, it was in the news lately, like, they were saying that the best thing uh, to not get this peanut allergy is to expose your children early to peanuts and peanut butter and this and that, and I think it's I, I tell you, my, in my grandkids' uh, preschool, they won't allow them to bring yeah. peanut butter sandwiches. But I think it's true because when I was younger, I didn't have a problem eating you know, cereals and soda and stuff and candy, and I slowly stopped drinking soda, slowly stopped eating breakfast cereal, and I think it was the avoidance of those things that I, that's the only reason I could think of yeah. that I have this. It's strange. <clears throat> basically losing tolerance to... Right, yeah. <clears throat> well, I think the short answer is there's no clear explanation for that. Yes, sir. If it turns out that allergies are inducing the asthmatic mm -hmm. reaction, how successful would the shots, the, uh, the shots to give you the uh, immunity to... Well, to what, whatever you're well okay, let's... Actually, you bring up an interesting point. That, and let me enlarge on that. Uh, this Zol Zolaire, again, is for asthmatics who have these high levels of that particular protein and just aren't responding to medicine. However, there's also what we call desensitization shots, okay, which the allergists do. When they identify what you're allergic to, then they, then they give you these, these shots of whatever it is in that thing that you're allergic to that begins to desensitize to you. Now, that's not used as much as it used to because it's, it's, it's never permanent. Mm -hmm. At best, it might last two or three years, okay, uh, the, the, the lack of, of sensitization. So um, I haven't seen that used as much as it might have been used 20 years ago or, or, or so. But yeah, that, uh, so the short answer to your question is, uh, it may work, but it's, it's not a lifetime solution. Yes, sir, in the back. What about the Spireva? Can we use it with Advert? Okay. Um, I'm glad you brought up Spireva. Uh, Spireva is another controller medicine. And the generic name of Spireva is Teotropium. Just like Advardular and Simbicort have the long-acting form of albuterol, teotropium or spireva has the long-acting form of ipratropium or atrovent, okay? And again, teotropium has been very important in patients, smokers who have COPD. But more and more patients with asthma are also using spireva. Spireva. It's safe to use it with oh yeah, I know it's, it's 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 safe to use it because and there should be some synergism because they work on the lung in different ways, okay. In fact, you know, a lot most patients with COPD who get started on uh, uh, Spireva also end up being on one of these. So the the worse the patient gets, the more medicine they end up being on. But I'm glad you brought that up because. Uh, there's, there should be a, a synergism between the two, and, and using one doesn't mean you can't use the other. 
Okay. Yes, ma'am. Do you know if through genetics children can, uh, can develop a predisposition to asthma? Well, the short answer is yes, because asthma does run in families, okay? And you may not have anyone in your family who has asthma, but you may have other people who have bad allergies. Okay, yeah. And to, to that point, that, you know, that brings up, I want to say two things that can complicate asthma and make it worse. And one is post-nasal drip or allergic rhinitis, and the other is acid reflux, okay? So we always ask asthmatics, you know, do you have nasal symptoms, any heartburn? Uh, and if we're having trouble controlling their asthma, sometimes we just put them on things for, for uh, allergic rhinitis or put them on things for acid reflux to see whether it helps them. Yes, ma'am. Does it cause chest pain in deep breathing? Uh, if you have chest pain, I'd worry about something worse, maybe um, uh, worry about uh, pneumonia. You know, uh, typic asthma typically shouldn't cause chest pain. So if a patient with asthma complained to be about chest pain, I'd get a chest x-ray right away to make sure there wasn't something else going on in the chest. Now, but although let me add, if an asthmatic coughs a lot, you know, someone who's coughing all day long, you know, they strain the muscles and then they can develop chest pain. It's not really pain in the lungs, it's pain in your ribs. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk about extreme cold and whether that can trigger an asthma attack? And I'm talking about like, you know, negative 20 type huh. temperatures. Well, again, the short answer is yes, and in fact, Going back to exercise-induced asthma that, that you can see in teenagers on sports, there are various theories about why that happens, but the most common theory is that when you're exercising strenuously, you're, you hyperventilate, right? You breathe in and out, breathe in and out. So normally when, when we breathe, by the time the air gets into our lungs, number one, it's warm, and number two, it's moist, okay? But if you're doing the marathon, or skiing or something like that, and hyperventilating, the air getting into the lung is drier and colder. And that's the most common explanation for exercise-induced asthma. So to your question, I would say, sure, if you have asthma and you're in an extremely cold environment with cold, yeah, you're much more likely to have an attack. Sir? You mentioned that post-nasal drip can have uh, an effect on asthma. Right. Is a sinus condition, is that induced by, uh, by allergies? It could be. It could be. Or there could be some structural problem in, in the sinuses that they're, they're not draining uh, very well. Right. Right. Ma'am. I've been told that long-term use, in particular they said Advair, could actually shorten your life. Is there any mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and, and I know there is that warning, but it's just, you know, I think that goes back to the study that it's about 20 years old, uh, where uh, the one component of, of, of Advair, not the steroid, but, but was used and, and people seemed to, to do worse. But that's, that's simply not the common experience of those of us that take care of asthmatics. Okay, you know. Yes, sir. Any medicine to reduce the secretion in a long pathway? Well, you know, there are expectorants to help you get it out. And, the, you know, the most common one is guaifenesin, which is Robitussin, Mucinex, uh, uh, you know. In, in fact, uh, you know, we like uh, people with asthma or even COPD to keep themselves well hydrated so that the mucus in their lungs doesn't get as thick and difficult to raise. What about benzoids? Uh, well, that's a cough suppressant, Tessalon pearls. It works for some people, doesn't work for everyone. Yeah. And it's expensive. Yes, ma'am. And what about the leukotriene inhibitors? 
Oh, okay. Thanks for reminding me. Yes. One of the world's most prescribed drugs. Yes, thanks for reminding me. That's Singulair. It is, in fact, it may be the, the world's most prescribed drug. It's extremely common. Unfortunately, it's generic now. Mont Montelukast. And yes, Singulair is an anti-allergy medicine. However, having said that, it may also work in asthmatics who don't have clear allergies. So, you know, and any asthmatic, and, and it's, it's another controller. Any asthmatic that's needing, you know, their rescue medicines every day, I would want at least to have them try Singulair to see whether they got better. You know, it's a, it's a pill once a day. And again, it's, it's uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that was brought up. And how does it differ from Zapper Lucase? Is it a mechanism okay. of action? No, well, the, there is, there is a pharmacologic difference. The problem with uh, uh, Zafirlucast, um, uh, if that's the one I'm thinking of, used to ta have to take it three or four times a day. Uh, but um, or, no, I'm, that's no, that's the other one. You don't see it's a Zyluton. You don't see that uh, anymore. But um, again, because this is generic and it's cheap. You know, it's it's you know it's easy to prescribe. So, yeah. Now you talk about sh shortness of breath can relate to the heart. Oh sure. Oh yeah. I mean congestive heart failure. You know, uh, or cardiomyopathy where the where the the heart is weak. So when you try to do anything strenuous, the heart can't pump enough blood out to your muscles. Okay. So just like any of us. If we're completely healthy, you know, if we try to run the marathon or something like that, <clears throat> we're going to get shorter breath. It doesn't mean that we don't have enough oxygen. It's just that we're not getting enough oxygen to our muscles to keep up with what they have to do. And so someone who is in heart failure <clears throat> experiences that even on mild exercise. When I had my heart attack, yeah. he said I'll never have congestive heart failure again. Well, good, good. But then I had a three-way bypass. Right. <laughs> but are you on a diuretic like Lasix? Well, I, yeah, I've never had that. You I never had that, been. yeah, OK. Well, coronary artery disease, yeah, we can do something about that, OK? But a lot of uh, congestive heart failure is secondary to hypertension that's not been adequately treated. You know, high blood pressure, if it's not adequately treated, it changes the heart. And the heart gets to where it, it, it can't work as well. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, singular and Montelukast. Yeah, the, I mean, there's the they same thing. It for people with allergies. Right, but again, even patients without definite allergies may do better on Singular. Okay, because what Singular does is it inhibits something called a leukotriene, and we know that leukotrienes are a prominent reason for the symptoms in asthma, causing the bronchospasm. That's why Singular is so commonly used in, in asthma, even if you can't pinpoint a specific allergy in the patient. Sir. The difference between regular prednisone 10 milligram, 20 milligram versus Metal prednisolone, okay. Yes. Uh, the uh, medrol dose pack. Um, prednisone is much cheaper. <laughs> okay, that's one difference. Theoretically, uh, methyl prednisolone is better for people who may, may have some kind of liver disease, okay? Because when you take prednisone, your liver converts it to the prednisolone, okay? So if you have problems with your liver, then, then the medrol, you don't, it doesn't require the liver to con convert it, okay? Uh, and uh, it's, it's a therapeutic effect should be about the same, 
Okay. What about the dose? The four milligram versus the ten twenty or different? Uh, my recollection is that four milligrams of the uh, Medrol is equivalent to ten milligrams of the prednisone. It's something like that. Oh, something like that. Yes, ma'am. Picking up on what the other lady said about cold uh, air, <clears throat> can you have or develop? An allergy to cold. Well, no, you can't develop an allergy to cold, but you can develop a sensitivity to cold, which actually brings up another point about, about asthma. Something like 15% of asthmatics are not allergic to, but are sensitive to aspirin. And not only aspirin, but that whole family, ibuprofen, naproxen, those, as, those uh, other drugs that are in the same family with, a, with aspirin, can precipitate an asthmatic attack. It's not a true allergy, it's a hypersensitivity uh, to those drugs. And so the same thing would apply to cold air. It's not a true allergy, it's just a hypersensitivity to the coldness. Okay.